everybody for joining us today. I'm Laura from Good Things Foundation and we have Kevin from Good Things Foundation joining us as well. We're really pleased that we've got Helen Groves from HG Consulting here with us today, who's going to talk to us about preparing for delivering a quality experience for learners around essential digital skills. We are recording the session today, so if you'd rather have your camera off, you're welcome to do that. The slides and the recording will be shared later, so there's no need to be scribbling anything down, you will have all the slides with you. And um, we're going to ask that you keep on mute while we go through the session just to avoid any background noise. But you're welcome to ask questions in the chat panel as we go along, which myself and Kevin will be monitoring and we'll bring any questions that you have for Helen for her attention as we go. Um, there will be some interaction in the session today with some discussion, some reflection and some breakout rooms about you and your specific organisations. Without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and hand over posting to Helen right. to continue with her presentation. Right, so if I can just get my screen up, that would be good. There we go. So hopefully everybody can see that. So we, we're looking at providing a quality learning experience. If I just give you all um, a bit of my background, uh, I, I've, I've been a teacher all my working life, starting off in secondary schools, but throughout my very long uh, career. I've worked in uh, all aspects of education, really further education, higher education and community education. And perhaps that's what's more relevant in terms of my experience that I'm going to be sharing with you today, because my last full time role was as chief executive of a large um, learning consortium working in the community, particularly with vulnerable groups, priority groups, and largely via the voluntary and community sector. But the other thing that's probably tangentially um, important for today is I am also an Ofsted inspector, but please don't hold that against me. I'm not going to talk Ofsted. I'm going to touch on it just so that you're aware of it and what do they do, uh, but I'm not going to get bogged down in all the Ofsted traumas that uh, uh, seems to follow it around. So I'm going to look at um, a quality of learning experience very much from a generic point of view, uh, not necessarily from a digital point of view, because good teaching and learning and a quality learning experience is the same, whether it's through digital experience or whether it's through face to face. So it's about what makes a good learning experience from a learner's perspective. That's really important to be thinking about what it is that you offer to learners and seeing that from their point of view. So I think it, everybody will have picked up that we're living in very, very changing and challenging times for all our learning sectors, whether it be children in primary school, whether it be children in secondary school, further education, college, higher education, it doesn't matter. It's very, very challenging times at the moment and things are changing virtually on a weekly to, to monthly basis. If we were to sit down and do some kind of SWOT analysis in terms of the environment within which we are operating, I think this, this is just a flavour of the threats that are out there. And by no means is it exhausting. I think all of us could sit down and add at least another half a dozen to these. But I think one of the things that we're wrestling with constantly is funding. Um, it always seems to be very difficult to get our hands on funding. It always seems to come with um, conditions. It al always seems to come in a very complex uh, procurement uh, process. And I, whilst I think very often we get seduced by the news that says that there's new funding out there to do this, that and the other, I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that we've suffered really damaging severe cuts uh, collectively over and, and accumulatively over a large number of years and whilst a bit of new money might get injected I think one thing we can safely say it never fills the gap that's been left there before and what it does is it makes it, whatever funding is available at this particular time makes it highly contestable so there are lots and lots of different organisations that are after a small amount of money, which means, you know, you've got to be very sort of competitive when you are bidding for funding. And as time goes on, that's going to be more, more so. Um, when I was chief executive of uh, um, a learning consortium, working primarily with the voluntary sector as deliverers, um, they had been brought up, if you like, 
on a funding regime that was very grant based. And so therefore they just applied for money, they were given grants and there wasn't a lot of accountability. And a lot of those grants were allocated on the, on the basis of capacity building, allowing other organisations, other charities, other small community based organisations to build their capacity to help their service users or their client groups but over time capacity building funds are shrinking and shrinking all the time and it's more about competitive activity to to get applications in for funding sitting outside of how we operate of course we're working now within a, a, a massive economic recession not least of which because of the pandemic and I think one of the things that we're now identifying, and I'm, I'm not political in any way, and I, but I do think we have to look at what's been said on the news at the moment in terms of the, the um, jobs vacancies that are available as a result of Brexit. And, uh, you know, this mis mismatch between the number of jobs that are available and the number of people that are unemployed. We've got a real tension going on there. And at the same time, we're in an economy that needs to come bouncing back very quickly and very steeply. So there's a lot of conflict going on around the, um, you know, the environment that we're working within. I've already mentioned the complexity of trying to land money. Certainly one of the things that uh, was noticeable to me when, when I uh, took over as chief executive, we were working with a lot of delivery partners who were very small organizations. And for them, learning was not their raison d'etre. So let's say for sake of argument, I might be working with a charity that works uh, with homeless people. And they did some learning to help people to maybe develop confidence or to uh, develop their own self-awareness or to seek support or whatever. And, and learning, the funding we offered for learning was to help them to wrap it around what was their core um, service to their units, users. Now, as competition for money became more and more stringent, then more and more we had to ask um, these small organisations to jump through accountability hoops. And of course, for them, it became incredibly difficult because they didn't have people who collected data on learning. They didn't have quality managers. They didn't have necessarily um, teacher trained staff. And I can remember having some very difficult conversations with leaders of charities who've said, look, Helen, we get about £10,000 a year from you, which is great. But in terms of what we need to do to get that money and to account for that money, we could easily stand on the street and rattle a tin and get just as much money. So therefore, it's easier to take a, a more traditional route to bring money in. And, and I would be the first to admit, you know, that's absolutely correct. And if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. But similarly, what we have to do is once we draw down money from government funds or other places, we do have to uh, uh, comply with their demands and their conditions about accounting for how that money is spent. So there is a tension in there sometimes about accessing money and then being accountable for what you do with it. I think the other thing that's a threat, particularly for small organisations uh, and those organisations who are not essentially learning organisations, is the fact that there is now a greater focus on who is actually doing the delivery. Are these qualified teachers or are these, you know, not, in, not meant in any disrespectful way, but are these enthusiastic amateurs, people who have a a knowledge or a skill in the subject and you know I've got the time to volunteer to share their their enthusiasm and their knowledge with other people but more and more with with drawing funding now with, with their expectation is that we we are using and we are delivering learning through teachers who are trained and qualified and more importantly up to date with their continuous professional development requirement so that's something to be aware of in terms of your own delivery staff and then, of course, for those of you that aspire in the future to access government funding, uh, then you do come into the realms of Ofsted, where you would be considered as a new provider, and then you would have to meet the quality framework, and you would be subject to Ofsted inspections, which brings with it a whole new layer of bureaucracy and accountability that for some people might be overburdening in terms of... Um, the scale of what they do. 
So that's just a, a view about the potential threats. And as I said, I'm sure if I ask you to come up with more, you could come up with as many as I've come up with. On the other side, I think we need to look at the opportunities that sort of um, present in themselves. And that is that uh, the, the latest post-16 education bill that came uh, is going through Parliament on the 18th of May, it does sort of underpin some quite large scales uh, reforms set out in the skills white paper. And the, the, the most significant one is that, that people should be able to learn train or retrain and access new and updated skills at any time in their lives after age 16. So it's it's trying to recognise that people no longer have a job for life. People are made redundant, you know, maybe not just once, twice, several times, or their sector may um, shrink, or they may just literally want to move sectors. And sometimes they can't leave a job to be able to be trained to, to take up a new opportunity. But now there's, there's this um, suggestion that we should be allowing access, that opportunity to make these decisions and change and upskill at any point with support from the age of 16. Uh, there is a strong focus on rebuilding communities and uh, we see that in terms of the devolution of a lot of the budgets and a lot of responsibilities to local authority and, and trying to charge local authorities with meeting needs of their own local communities. So it may be that some of the funding that you would have accessed previously, you may have to access through local authorities. But I don't think for one minute you would expect that to be any less cumbersome, any less bureaucratic. In fact, the risk is it could be even more bureaucratic. And, and the other thing is it's probably watered down in as much as the local authorities are probably taking management fees off the top of it. The government are keen to introduce new providers into the market. And so as new providers, you know, you are welcome into the market, but it does mean that you are competing with some very big fish. So you will be competing with colleges who are multi, multi, multi million pound organisations. And particularly if they are a, an organisation that's a result of several merged college, colleges, you could be, you know, competing for the same funding with a college who's bringing in 130 million pounds. And, and, and that, you know, speaks for itself in terms of the structure that supports that and the manpower and the workforce that's there available to sort of meet the accountability requirements. But it doesn't take away from the fact that the government are keen to introduce new providers into the market. Obviously, there's been a slow drift towards improving technology to support learning. And I think it's been, you know, it has been slow on the uptake. It has been largely optional for organisations to, to do that. It's been largely optional for teachers to embrace online or blended learning. But of course, the pandemic has brought a tsunami of demand for improved technology. And that, that support in order to access technology as a model and a platform for learning has improved quite significantly. So I think we are, you know, uh, riding a wave as it were in, in terms of the pace of change in, in technology and learning. And therefore sitting on the back of that is the demand for digital skills is increasing rapidly. Now, I do a lot of observation of, say, adult learning services where their staff have moved online, sorry, moved learning from out of the classroom to online. And I'm speaking to a lot of tutors and a lot of learners, adult learners who are accessing online learning. And it's it's very Marmite, as I would, as you would imagine. Some don't like it and particularly ESOL learners don't like it because they find the biggest advantage and the big, biggest synergy to their learning is through meeting other people in the classroom and speaking. Other learners like it because it's, it allows them to be flexible, particularly when they were homeschooling or if they've got childcare and they can log on and they can pick up their learning as and when they like. So there's a, there's a whole plethora of uh, appreciation of learning online, but there's no doubt about it. You can't do it unless you've got the digital skills to access it in the first place. So that's a real opportunity for the type of learning that's you know, being rolled out from, from your organizations. And of course, 
as colleges get bigger and local authorities get more fragmented, um, then there is a lot more outsourcing of provision and particularly discrete and niche type provision. So some of the organisations that may be with us today or working with good things might aspire to become a subcontractor or a partner to a larger organisation rather than trying to go head first in terms of um, trying to get your own contract. So th those are sort of a sample of strengths and weaknesses. But the, um, the one thing I would say is that for any provider who is seeking to be on the landscape of learning in the future, the one thing you will not escape is the need to deliver quality. Even if you are successful in accessing funding, it won't be a case of, you know, well, I'm glad you've got the funding and I hope you're doing good things with it and I hope you're doing worthy things with it. You will be held to account for how you spend, spend that money. And one of the dimensions of being held to account is what is the quality of provision and how are you delivering good quality provision in a cost effective way? So one of the things I'd like you to do now, just on your own, a bit of reflection, is to think of your organisation and, and to complete this sort of SWOT analysis. What do you think are two of your key strengths as an organisation for delivering learning? And what do you think are two of your areas that really could be prioritised for improvement? So I'm going to give you about, well, let's say four minutes then to think of two strengths and two weaknesses. So we're not going to speak to anybody. It's just quiet self-reflection and just jot the notes down for yourself. We will have an opportunity to share these with other people in a moment, but just to give you the space to think about your two strengths and your two key weaknesses looking forward. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to put you into two breakout rooms. So I'm going to put people together randomly. What I'd like you to do is to discuss what you feel your strengths and weaknesses are looking to the future in terms of your preparedness for the future. And, and, and I don't want you to alter anything, but I want you to think about where did the importance of good quality learning feature in terms of, do you think you deliver a good quality learning the um, experience was that one of your strengths or do you feel that the quality of your learning experience is something that you ought to prioritize for improvement so I'm going to put you into two breakout rooms now um, for five minutes and hopefully that you will all get a chance to speak uh, please don't leave it to, to one person to do all the talking it's important that we share our ideas and we, we see how how we sit uh, in context with other people so I'm going to put them into two breakout rooms. We're back. Not on mute. Everyone's on mute. <laughs> we all get caught out, don't we? Everyone's we all get on mute. caught out. Need some digital skills. Yes, quite. <laughs> I think I need I need glasses because I can't see the little red uh icon <laughs> thing. But um could I just ask, I mean, I didn't join one of the rooms, but can I ask those people who are in the other rooms? So, for instance, Kevin, what, what was the, what, where was the debate about the quality of the, of the learning experience? Did it come out as a, people seeing it as strength in that way they do, or was it something that they felt needed improving? Well, we, we certainly heard about a, a lot of really good strengths. So a lot about sort of the, the trusted space for learners, so yeah. um, uh, being in sort of community settings, in, in uh, libraries, places like that, that, that people trust and feel that they can go to and they'll be supported. Um, uh, and uh, Sandra from, from Coventry were, was explaining about how they'd, um, uh, she, she said, it feels like years ago, and we never actually got to quite how long ago it was. So let's not discuss that part. But um, they put everybody through the uh, the Dettles uh, yeah. and then the qualified teacher status uh, and really sort of picked up on how how that had sort of uh, professionalised that service yeah. um, and the way that they built up a, a, a peer support network for their their tutors as well. Uh, on the back of that so when they get new people in that 
haven't got that qualification but have sort of a specialism they're supported to to sort of still deliver that quality learning yeah. experience it's interesting because uh, years ago when uh, um, I was an inspector. One of the uh, performance indicators, if you like, that Ofsted used to apply was the percentage of staff in the provider who were qualified with teacher status. But of course, um, as of September 2013, Michael Gove, in his wisdom, removed the requirement for anybody teaching in post 16 to have a teaching qualification. Um, I'll, I'll reserve my thoughts on that decision, but um, what it did mean is that it was up to the provider then to decide what, what was a well-qualified workforce. And where that left us in terms of Ofsted, all we could do was to make judgments about whether the people doing the delivery had the skills and expertise to teach. We couldn't anymore say, you know, are they teacher trained and qualified? Because, you know, there is no requirement to be so. But of course, one of the difficulties, if, if people are deemed to not have the skills and expertise to teach, very often when you scrape off the surface, it's because they've never been trained to do so. So, you know, there is a cause and effect role in there. And one of the things I, I really need to put on the table in terms of if, if, our, if organisations are thinking moving forward in terms of into the realms of getting government funding that would be exposed to Ofsted, then it's a very, very strong emphasis on the quality of teaching and the calibre and expertise of teaching staff. In fact, the, the framework for inspection is littered with a lot of terminology that you probably would never hear unless you were in a teaching training uh, class. So we use they use words like um, metacognition, pedagogy, uh, long term memory, sticky learning, uh, Socrat Socratic questioning. All that is now in the Ofsted framework. And as I say, for, for many, they probably would never have heard that language had they not done uh, teacher training and qualifications. So it's just, you know, um, alerting people to the fact that should you move into the realms of being inspected, then the calibre of your teaching staff are very, very much centre stage. So um, um, I just want to look now at this concept of the learner's experience. I think we talk about all the time the learner's journey and for a lot of learners it is a journey whether it be a journey towards an accredited qualification whether it be a non-accredited course or whether it just be a short enabling uh, learning program for those learners it, it will be a journey and one that they go set off on for a variety of reasons and of course once you start dealing with learners uh, there's a whole range of things that get, you know, sort of presented to them as they pro progress along this journey. There are all kinds of things that act as blockages that slow them down. There, there are a whole lot of things that at particular times in their life, they may be going through a good patch and everything's working for them. They're feeling motivated. They're feeling enthusiastic. And yes, they're in the groove and this bit of learning goes well. And then there may be other times when, you know, they totally hit a barrier, uh, you know, for whatever reason of what's going on in their life means, you know, they just can't go any further. And I think one of the things we, we really ought to be thinking about is when we take on learners, how much of this can we actually find out before they actually start? Because what we should be doing with learners, particularly what I call fragile adult learners, and by that, I don't necessarily mean that, um, that they are vulnerable in any way, but their learning experience in the past has led them to be less trusting of learning. They are a bit fragile. They, 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 they could sort of fall away at any time. I think we, we need to find out what kind of support is likely to be required at what particular time, uh, because this could be the difference between them dropping off and perhaps re- uh, re-cementing or reinforcing their bad experiences from the past or keeping going and coming out with something good at the end of it. 
So there's a lot of store set on what kind of work you do with the learners at the beginning or what we call initial assessment. Because once they get to the end of this journey, and it could be a long journey because it could be an accredited qualification, they could be on an English course, an ESOL course that takes a long period of time, or as I said, they could be on non-accredited, that it's just a, a, a helpful programme that, that providers put on. It might be health, well-being, managing debt, you know, looking after yourself, those kinds of things that are written specifically in a bespoke way for that particular client group. But what happens at the end of it then is we need to be saying how better prepared are they to carry on and go forward in terms of what is their final destination? Where are they? Are they aiming for employment? Are they aiming to successfully draw down benefits? Are they aiming to be more independent in their community? Are they aiming to volunteer? Are they aiming to um, help their children with their homework? Or are they aiming to be able to interact with school more effectively? Are they aiming to interact with local government services more effectively? Uh, you know, there's a whole range of things as to why people have um, embarked on this journey. And it's really important that we find out those reasons so that we don't just deliver content, but we allow learners to relate that content to what it is that they're trying to achieve. And this is why this, we, we talk about the quality of the learner's journey and the importance of initial assessment. So we don't wait till they disappear off the, off the landscape and then we, we uncover by whatever means, first, second, third, fourth hand, that they had a problem that could have been a, a, a made aware of before they came and before they started. So this, this notion of initial assessment has got, in good quality provision, has got two perspectives. It's one in terms of looking back. So, you know, what have you done? What experience have you got? What prior learning? What existing skills have you got? What do you already know? Because what we don't want is for people to start on a program and just keep doing the same stuff because the same stuff is at the beginning of every program. And so they never get any further because they're always covering the same ground. So they go from A to Z, sorry, they go from A to E, loads and loads of different times, but they never get past E. You know, we want to encourage learners to, to stretch themselves further. So we need to be looking back in terms of how can we build on what they already know and what they already can do. But at the same time, we need to be looking forward. Where do they want this journey to take them? And it might just be steps in the right direction. This short program, it might be a few hours, it might be half a day, it might be a full day. But do you know what? It's steps towards where they want to be. They are positive steps forward. So that's why we need to know where the, the journey is taking them. So if we were to say, right, what would make us a good provider? A good provider is one that sort of places the learner at the heart of all decisions and processes. Everything is viewed from a learner's perspective. Now, I know that's really difficult when you're in a management position and you've been pulled in all directions and you've got to do this for funders and you've got to do this for the local authority and you've got to meet this requirement for your board or your trustees or whatever. You're trying to be all things to all men. But when it comes to quality learning, we have to be quite relentless in making sure that learners are at the heart of what we do and the decisions that we take and if we have really sound organizational structures and, and, and systems and places uh, such as systems and arrangements then we should be doing rain checks all along the learner's journey to make sure that it's as good as we possibly can make it for all learners every time now that sounds a bit like mcdonald's because that's mcdonald's um, that's their sort of strap line, isn't it? That everybody gets the same experience regardless of what McDonald's you go into. It's replication, it's reliable. Uh, so, and that's really what we're after, that everybody gets a, a, a good experience. So what I want you to think about now, if I was to say to you individually, are you a good provider? Hopefully you'd all say no, but what I really want to get underneath is, how do you know? What, what do you use? What are the key performance indicators that you use to tell yourself, your trustees, your staff, your service users to prove that you are a good provider? 
So I just want you to think about, I'm going to give you what we call a silent minute. And that's a silent minute's reflection to see where you are on those two questions, three questions, sorry. First of all, are you a good provider, a quality provider? Secondly, how do you know? And thirdly, how could you prove it? What are the indicators that would prove you are a quality provider? Now then I'm gonna ask you to unmute and share with us all what your thoughts were. And I'm really interested in the last bit about how do you know and how, how can you prove it? So it looks here as if Sandra's raised her hand. Is that a question, Sandra? No, it's to give your answer. All right. Oh, wow, well, good. You can kick us off. Let's start with you, Sandra. Lovely that we've got somebody so keen. <laughs> um, so do you think you're a quality provider? I do. Right. So how do you know then? How do I know? Well, when you were saying earlier about the fact that Ofsted look in our, and look at the quality of the teachers and this, their qualifications and their status. We, as I've said in the breakout room that, um, many, I say many years, I know Kevin goes, she didn't say how many years ago, but it, it, was, it was a standard, oh, you're looking about 10 years ago now, but to do that over say 200 plus staff, it did take a few years to, to complete. Yeah. But it was set as a standard that all teachers be qualified to debtors if they hadn't already got like a PGC yeah. or something like that. So that's a, key, that's a KPI, isn't it? And that was our KPI for the quali qualifications for teaching. And then they went on to get QTLS thereafter. Um, then as far as what we deliver to our learners, how do we know? We know by their feedback. We know by the, the, the comments that they make on the surveys that we send out per course. So we can look course by course at their feedback. We can tell by, because we do do the initial assessment. So we've got the key performance that indicators there through the matrix. Good. To prove that our advice and initial advice and guidance is there and in place and is of good quality. So we've got all of that going on. So that's the initial part of the journey. We set their individual learning names. We have learner records, you know, be, it be a journal or an AL um, assessment for learning paperwork, or that's RAPA paperwork for community yeah, learning. Yeah, I understand that, yeah. Yeah, but not everybody does, do they? No, no, no. Um, that's, term, or, that's jargon, isn't it? It is, it is. And, um, so, sorry to interrupt Sandra, but just, just to give other people a chance as well. So what you're saying, you have got a set of KPIs that are in place and that you um, test those out and check those out um, throughout the learner's journey. Is that is that a good fair summary? That's a good summary. That is a good That's, summary. Thank you. As you said on that map, it's about how that journey is affected by yeah. all the barriers that are put in that happen in people's lives and then how you can support them. Right, because to what continue we're learning to do is to make that journey as smooth and as mm. positive as it can be. Yeah. And so if you know your problems, you can preempt them. Stuart, right. can I can I bring you in here? Because I know you're a, a different organization in as much as you're more like the organization I described in the first place about providing learning as an opportunity. Uh, uh, to wrap around your core service and to enable learners to do, to do other things. So yeah. how how good do you think your learning experience is from a quality point of view? Well, <laughs> ours, we, we record um, specific outcomes. So if, if, if they've had a, a, a problem that they've come to us about, we will then see whether digitally we've helped them to resolve that problem and that gets recorded onto a casebook system which then closes the case as to why the client may have come to us in the first place hopefully it's quite um easy to to well, i wouldn't say easy but it, it's easy to record in as much as it did they come to us because they were looking to uh, learn digital to be able to gain employment and they needed help with that in which case yes, we did achieve their objective. 
did they come to us because they were experiencing um, debt problems and needed to know how to resolve them digitally and we helped them do that? That's a, a yes. And so that's easily recorded. Others will then go on from that, hopefully, um, to then do digital learning, in which case we'll then point them towards the Learn My Way modules and we'll right. then work with them as and when they need. And we can obviously monitor and help them if they're struggling or, 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 or where they're getting to with, with achieving certification. Okay. So what I'm hearing from that then is your KPIs are more outcome-based rather than process-based. Yes, they are outcome based. Yeah. Yeah. Because one of the things we would be interested in, what was the quality of the delivery of the learning that led to that successful outcome? Sometimes I think we've got a myth going on that says, if you get a good outcome, the experience must have been a good one. And that is not always the case. That is not always the case. So it's just being mindful of how you're quality assuring the process. But you, you again, you might say as an organisation, it's, it's not... Um, cost effective for us to do that because of the amount of learning that we do. I'm just going to go to, is it Shafikal? And, and, yeah, do you want to turn on your mic, please? You're still not, you're still on mute. Okay. Oh yes, we can hear you now. Sorry, can I just be rude and ask your name? Because I, I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. Yeah, Shaf Shafikal. Shafiqul. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We we believe we are we are we are a quality provider because we have got systems and places, systems and procedures are in place to deliver a wide range of learning. We are matrix accredited and investors in people recognized. Yeah. We are registered with five awarding bodies. Yeah. OCR, AQ, etc. So we, during the last 30 years, we have delivered about 4,000, actually to be precise, 4,039 accredited qualification, about 20% of whom were IT based. Our, the, we are funded through a variety of funding sources, which requires us to deliver a range of outcomes and outputs. Uh, we have always been able to, uh, to deliver those. How do you know? From internal evolution to external evolution. Right. So we are one of the larger community organization based in Leicester. We are a holistic organization, actually. We have a broad spectrum of services which we deliver. So it sounds to me again, uh, Shafikul, that you've got a lot of emphasis placed on uh, outcomes at the end of the program, because that's awarding body driven, that's qualifications, and, and that's sort of um, what you deliver, you're successful in delivering as a, uh, as a content driven thing. Yes, also okay. we have got, we look at the out, out, outcomes as well. Yeah, outcomes. As so well. Performance and outcomes. Yeah, out, outputs and outcomes. All yeah. right. We could say that. I'm, I'm, sorry, that to, sorry to interrupt. I'm just, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. And I just want to reinforce this message to everybody that outcomes is a very important performance indicator, but it is not the be all and end all because we can, you know, we can talk about people who've got what they want from the learning program but they didn't particularly enjoy it and it wasn't particularly a good experience and the road wasn't particularly smooth or positive but because of their own motivation and their own enthusiasm to get to where they want to go they stuck with it and uh, I have interviewed hundreds if not thousands of adult learners in my well I've been an inspector since 1993 so I think that 
gives you an idea of how long I've been at this game. Um, and I have yet, I can count on one hand the number of adult learners who've given me a negative comment about their tutors. Adult learners are always very positive. They're always very supportive of their tutors. And even when I've seen some terrible, terrible teaching practice, when I speak to the learners in the class, the learners think the tutor's marvellous because there's this connection and the tutor's warm and welcoming and, you know, says very sort of encouraging and positive things. But in terms of the quality of the learning experience, not really that good. So I, I just want to move on. So the, the point I'm making to summarise is we need quality assurance of the process as much as quality indicators for the outcomes. You know, one does not guarantee the other. And a good process doesn't guarantee good outcomes, just like good outcomes doesn't guarantee good process. So if we look at contracting in our sector, there's five different tiers of contracting. If you look at the bottom tier, and, and I, I'm not sure who, who or if any of you are there, but it's basically um, grant funding, where you get money up front to go away and do great things, very worthy things. And uh, as long as you can prove that you've, you've done, you know, like, engage 50 learners, um, 50 homeless learners in a learning program. You know, as long as you can count the beans and tick the boxes, you'll get the money and you don't have it clawed back. That is slowly sinking, slowly sinking as, as an opportunity for funding. Tier two is where you get output based grants. So again, you can apply for a grant, and, but you have to give evidence of achieving the stated outcome. So, and that outcome is uh, sort of that sort of um, that data, for want of a better word, is collected at, uh, on the progression of the clients. Where do they go? And again, it doesn't always mean that if you don't get them to the end, that you lose your funding. You could start with 100 and end up with 10 and you'd still have the funding for 100. OK, again, that is sinking as is grant funding in general. Then you come on to tier three, which is non-accredited learning contract. Now, this is entering into uh, realms of more accountability where you're paid on results. You know, how many did you get to engage? How many did you roll, enroll? So you'll be given a target to enroll X number. How many of them stayed and how many of them achieved? So you're already starting to work with performance indicators set by the funder. Then you're at tier four, which is accredited contracts. And again, this is usually ESFA funding contracts. Uh, and that's very, very much um, structured. In fact, I would say belt and braces structure uh, for accountability for outcomes and numbers and progressions and achievement. Now, one of the things I want to share, say with you, and it's already emerging, you have a state of tension always between the contract compliance, what is it the funders want when they award you a contract? And I would say almost inevitably, it's outputs. It's number of qualifications, number of passes, number of destinations, number of jobs. You know, it's very, very focused on outputs. Funders are very, very rarely interested in quality. And when it comes to government funding, ESFA, for instance, they're not interested in quality. They leave that to Ofsted. So funders talk about contract compliance. What do you need to do to meet this contract requirement? And they don't care if you do it badly. They don't care how you get there in the end, as long as you get there. However, Ofsted come in and they look at the quality. Ofsted don't look at the money you've got. They look to see how well do you deliver good quality given the funding that you've got. So a lot of times people want to talk to us as Ofsted inspectors about how, how poor the budget is, how little money they've been given. Ofsted don't want to know. They're there to check the quality of what you do with the money that you've been given. Now, you're always living in this tension between what the funders are asking you for, for contract compliance. So it might be every learner completes an ILP. The funder might say, right, you've got 100 learners, you've got 100 ILPs, well done. Ofsted might come in and say, you know what, these ILPs are rubbish. These ILPs don't tell us anything. These ILPs are not worth the paper they're written on. But hey, you've got 100 ILPs, so the funder's happy. 
can you see the difference between the, 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 the demands from the contractor and the demands from the quality agenda? And you will live in that tension once you get into government funding. And, and I don't want to labour this, but this is the framework for Ofsted. So you can see just how extensive it is. And, and this, is, this is the main part. This is the main grade. And this is where you get all the thing about the quality is in here the uh, implementation about the teaching quality, the qualifications of staff, how effective they are at delivering. I mean, the intent is, why do you do what you do? And you have to prove that there's a demand for the courses that you put on. Or do you just think, oh, we can get a few bums on seat for this and therefore we can get a bit of money, so we'll put it on. This is about you making sure that curriculum is meeting the needs of the communities that you're supposed to be serving. That's driving what you're offering. Then implementation is about the quality of the delivery. And then your data comes in here, attainment and qualifications. So that's all I want to share with you with the Ofsted framework, because some of you might never go there. But you just, if that's where you're heading, not in the near future, but maybe medium term future, you need to be aware of the complexity of the accountability structure. So just to finish off with then, again, I want to give you a, uh, an, another moment to reflect, a silent moment, in terms of knowing what you know now, what, what do you see as your next steps? And, and, and in terms of going those next steps, what do you see as your main challenges? So I, I'll give you a, a silent minute to just gather your thoughts about that. Given what you've heard, what's your next steps? And what do you think your, your main challenges are? Because I would be saying to you, it doesn't matter where you get your money from. You have to focus on the experience of the learner and you've got to make that experience as positive as it can be. And that is particularly important for adult learners who many of whom have had very, very bad experiences, either at school or at college or at work, and they are damaged when it comes to learning. What you don't want to be doing is adding more damage. You want to be helping to repair. And that's why it's about the quality of that learner's experience perceived from a learner's point of view. So, Susan, can you turn your mic on and tell me what's your next step? What's your next challenge? Um, we've already sort of looked for the matrix framework and there's areas that we're really strong, lots of areas of development. So maybe to revisit that. And this um, is matrix as in IAG? Yeah, to make sure that us, um, it's, it's, it's a framework so, to make sure that if we are going to go for those contracts, that we are, you know, well placed to, to deliver them. We've got all the systems and the processes yeah. in place. Yeah. Just, just as a word of warning, matrix is only for IAG. So you're only talking about the beginning of the learner's journey. It doesn't cover the whole of the learner's journey. For what you do for Matrix, you need to replicate throughout the learner's journey. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's yes, just yes. IAG focused. Yes. Yeah. So what do you see as your main challenge? Um, capacity within our organisation. Yeah. Are our ambitions bigger than our actual yeah. ability to deliver them? Yeah, I think that's our, one, that's our main challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's fair comment for most people who are at the bottom end of contracting, because you don't have data managers, do you? You don't have quality managers. No. An and, and office manager that does everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, so, um, Stuart, what, what do you th think is your next step and what do you see as your next main challenge? Um, well, challenges. <laughs> Um, Just give me one. <laughs> I, I think our, our challenges, uh, they're, they're different because it's to do with other things that are going on. So if we got something like the job centre giving, handing out, busy handing out, um, what do they call them, tablets to people to be able to get, to be able to do things for themselves, uh, but not telling them how to do it or anything like that. We have to have the capacity to do that. Um be able to help them and also to implement I, I think I think you're right in what you're saying it's made me think a lot about the, the obviously all our clients they they resolve an issue and they they seem to be happy but I think our monitoring 
system could be a bit better for um, you know what hap- what what's happening to them afterwards and are you know re-engaging and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Because a lot of the people you pick up from DWP are in a revolving door. And you yeah. know, and that's what we've got to try and break down to, to make the experiences so positive and so productive that we, we break down that revolving door thing. Hundred percent, yeah. Thank you for that, Stuart. Uh, Sandra, your next step and your main challenge. The next step, I think, is for us to look at how we capture the evidence of how learners use what they've learned. Right. Okay. I think that is so important, Sandra, and I'm glad you said that, because one of the things that is so important, it's not about sitting there saying, oh, look at us, how good we are. We do this, we do that, we do the Mm. other. It's about how do you prove it? And you can, if I was to put you in the dock and accuse you of being an outstanding provider, I would only be able to convict you on the basis of the evidence that I've produced. So as your counsel, I couldn't stand there and just say, this this is a wonderful provider. The jury Mm. would need to see evidence. So you've raised a really important point there about where is the evidence to show that you're as good as you think you are. That's really valuable. Thank you. Because what we did recently, we changed our assessment for learning paperwork so that it reflected the three eyes that I've said, the, you know, intent, implementation and impact. That's right. Yes. So within each section of the paperwork, you've got that capture. Yeah. And then yeah. hopefully that will build our evidence base. Good, good. So because if anybody more... is thinking of touching base with Ofsted, as, as the framework sits at the minute, those three eyes must be absolutely tattooed on your brain mm. because you can't be judged to be good unless those three eyes are good. Okay, so they're like limiters, if you like. That's right. Um, Finally then, uh, Shafika, what about yourself? What's your next steps and what's your main challenge? Actually, we we are a long established organization. We are continuing to provide adult learning. Our main problem is to secure continuous funding. Yeah. Um, We also to provide a quality learning experience to our learners. Have Have you got the evidence? We, we we do the complete paperwork for this because most of our adult learning are okay. funded programs. So those requires a lot of lot of paperwork completion. Yeah. A lot of paper trails. Yeah. So we are not in charge of that, you know. In yeah. other words, we sometimes feel that, you know, um, we have to do overdo the paperwork. But as a as part of our service delivery, um, as a partner, as a delivery organization, we are also sub. We have been in the past subject to obstacle in inspection. Right. So you know what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. It's it's, it's not a very pleasant exercise at the beginning, but at the end, it is once there are. Yeah. It's not something you seek out, is it? (laughs) (laughs) True. Yeah, and again, I think you've raised an important point about the the paperwork and everything. And I do think we can get really overwhelmed with the weight of paperwork and bureaucracy, et cetera. And I think, you know, one of the things we must be really careful about is that we don't, and this is a mantra of mine, we don't hit the target and miss the point. And by that, I mean, we get all the paperwork in and we tick all the boxes and we meet all the deadlines or we meet all the audits and we miss the point about what we're trying to do. And that is have a positive impact on the lives of learners. That's what we're here to do. Our raison d'etre is not fulfilling paperwork in. It's a necessary evil. But let's not lose sight of, you know, the, the, the sort of point of why we're here. So, right, that's, that's great. And thank you for your feedback. And thank you for uh, joining in. So I'm just asking you, I'm going to ask you to complete now by just jotting something in the chat box that I can read and, and keep hold of that says, you know, as a result of what you've heard and done today, what's the one thing that you're going to take away from today's session? And if you could share that with me in the chat box, that would serve to me as some kind of feedback. And and while you're thinking about that, I'm going to put up my details in case 
anybody wants to get in touch with me at a later date. Okay, so um, one thing. So if you can start things coming through the chat box, that would be really good. And then we can sign off. Now I can't see what's coming through, Laura. Can you read to me? You're on mute. Sorry, Sorry I've yeah. taken a while to get myself on mute. <laughs> so uh, Susan says, reassessing our evaluation processes, how do we really know the impact of our work? Good. Uh, Sandra, question, are you a quality provider? How do you know? Yeah. Uh, so waiting for a few more to win. So Stuart, I would like our organisation to implement a better evaluation process. Good. I think that is coming through quite, that, that thing of you're saying about evidence in what we're doing. Yeah. I think yeah. Is, is really probably key to a lot of our centres really. Um, and Eamon's saying a renewed focus on the quality of the learning experience and um, reassessing our monitoring processes. So it is this paperwork, paper trail. Yeah. Evidence but do not hit the po hit the target and miss the point. That is so important. Do not hit the target and miss the point. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the meeting now. And unless there's any questions for me, I, it just remains for me to thank everybody for participating and for listening. Um, just a final request: Are there any questions? No. It's been lovely to share some time with you and who knows, maybe our paths might cross in the future when I come and inspect you. Thank you very much, Helen, for uh, the information you've shared with us today. I feel like it's been really um, given us a lot to reflect on and a lot to see what our strengths and limitations are. So it's been really, really helpful. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you.